Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. On today's episode, we are going to be breaking down the top 16 of Chaos Treasure 5. Now, this tournament may sound familiar because we covered my run in Chaos Treasure 5 last week, how I just barely missed the top 16. Let's talk about the real top 16 from that tournament here today. If you like videos like this, please make sure to hit like and subscribe as it helps out this channel a lot and it's free. You can just smash that like button. Nobody's stopping you. Also, if you are feeling super generous and want to support this channel as we try to move to full-time content creation please head over to patreon.com slash comedian mtg any help over there helps out the channel a lot helps us go and grow we finally sold out our coaching tier over at patreon but reminder cedh coaching can still be found by dming me on either twitter or discord or you can just hit me up at comedian mtg at gmail.com all of which are down in the description of this video without any further ado let's break down this top 16. we have grind them into dust by wounded satellite now now, this is a player you should recognize. Wounded has made several top 16, several top fours. I don't believe any tournament wins, but uh, multiple top cut performances with this Kinnon list specifically. Uh, one of the notable includes here is you'll see that Karn the Great Creator is one of the uh, the spicier Kinnon options available in this list. Not a lot of Kinnon lists run it, as long with uh, Tezzeret the Seeker as well. So definitely leaning a little more into the Planeswalker packages than you can normally find in Kinnon. Yeah, these Planeswalkers are obviously really strong. Tezzeret able to grab you either half of your basalt and mirage combo although let me check that they are running both pieces yeah so basalt and mirage mirror are both able to be grabbed off of tezzeret which is obviously really strong if you have one or the other and you know being able to combo off with these artifacts is super important to kinnon's game plan love seeing the one ring featured in this list it's i feel like kinnon is one of the best places for this you're a seedborn muse deck which is obviously the best synergy with the one ring on top of the fact that kinnon is just able to accelerate your mana so quickly and lacks inherent card draw in the command zone so instead of you know just pumping a bunch of mana to hopefully flip into something big with kinnon you can start getting multiple card draws with the one ring and then apart from cards like sylvan library you really don't use your life total that much so it's less likely to be uh, as much under pressure as other lists so i think the one ring is a really smart include in here apart from that a pretty standard kinnon package we see the inclusion of thorn mammoth which i've talked with satellite about thorn mammoth and they are very high on this inclusion uh glenn alendra archmage is another interesting one just being a counter spell on a stick two counter spells specifically. I, I've heard a lot of Kinnon pilots go sort of on and off on this card, but, you know, obviously being able to flip into it with Kinnon and just have a counter spell and a stick that Kinnon can grab is pretty solid. Now we have the same thing with Perplexing Chimera here, you know, sort of originated by Tyler from Play to Win, but the uh, Chimera synergy is obviously very strong in Kinnon's game plan. It's not a strategy that I really like. I think the Chimera stuff is a little too cute and also a little too chaotic for what I'm trying to do in a CEDH game, but uh, definitely really strong, and I know a lot of people People swear by this strategy so it's definitely still consistently doing stuff i think the thing satellites most known for in this archetype is the armored scrap gorger i think we've had a very long conversation about how they think this mana dork is like insanely powerful just the ability to like snipe important permanents out of your opponent's graveyard especially with underworld breach being such a dominant win condition in the format they really really stand by this card for sure apart from that nothing too crazy normal kin and stuff flipping in to some big big creatures and hopefully comboing off with your whole Breaker Horrors, your Tides about Tyrants, or your Basalt Monoliths. We have Tivit, but different by Akun Lob. I feel like this is a list that we said recently, or it might have been that I saw it at this tournament, but I definitely recognize this name. Uh, this is Tivit, but different, which is... Tivit, but not exceptionally different. Uh, I love the inclusion because Tivit, we've talked about this before on the channel, but Tivit's more of one of the mid-range decks of the format and having a Mind Sensor and Opposition Agent there to disrupt tutors, which are clearly like one of the best things to be doing in the format. It's like hating on draw and hating on tutors is one of the strongest stacks effects you can have in the format. So the fact that they're doubling up on the tutor hate is definitely something you don't see often in Tivit. It's not like a deck with like Timna where you can really pay off from a Mind Sensor being a flyer, but at the same time chip damage does come in handy at times also spell seeker not a card i traditionally find in these lists i love the inclusion of dark confidant i've been saying for a little bit that it's one of the underplayed cards in the format especially in mid-range decks i think you know people realized for a while that the format moved a little bit past confidant but i think we're in this weird space where we can kind of move back towards the dark confidants of the world especially in a list like this one where you can easily get it out turn one with a number of different opening hands and uh, it can gain you just you know even if it gets you like two or three cards in the game i think it's 
usually pretty worth it from a bear. This list also playing Peer. I think this is, might be one of the biggest differences in this Tivit list. Definitely uh, noticing Peer has a, has a very strong win condition. Obviously, Peer needs best to be able to draw half your deck, but very surprised to see it in a world of, uh, you know, Orcish Bowmasters, especially. Uh, and, you know, I find Peer and the best to be super easy to counter. Uh, so with Deflecting Swat and Bowmasters and, you know, straight up Swan Song off where you can't refuse, all of those effects, I tend to not really favor this card. It's a lot to tap out to have that countered by a one mana counter spell or even a, a free one that we also see the one ring in this list. I feel like that is a card we are going to be hearing a lot about moving forward. One of the most interesting cards in this deck is Necropotence. Necropotence not traditionally played in a lot of these more mid-range decks, as I mentioned. So very interesting to see it see play here. I feel like it's a little bit better than it would be in some of the more traditional mid-range decks, but I always found that because Tivit doesn't commit too much to the board, my life total is always in pressure with this list. So seeing it playing a Necro, which just basically begs your opponents to fully swing out at you is kind of wild. And Dress Down is also very interesting because I believe all of the win conditions in Tivit require you to have creatures online. So this is a very defensive Dress Down, I'd be guessing. We have Primal Niv by Shauna Giles. This is Niv, once again, Shauna showing up, making a top 16 with this Niv Mizzet list. Uh, for those who don't know, Niv is like the definitive control deck of the format. If Niv resolves, you're having a hard time, especially if you're trying to fight it with instants and sorceries. It's a deck that is meant to be pretty consistent at just getting Niv down really early and then just playing, you know, 41 instants. <laughs> I think that that is pretty indicative of what the list is trying to do. 41 instants and five sorceries. So 46 of the 99 cards that are not the commander are instants and sorceries. So that should really be indicative of uh, exactly what is happening. And then you'd be surprised how many of the other permanents or just cards in the deck are specifically ramp pieces. <laughs> but yeah, so trying to win curiosity combos, trying to do the thing. This deck's been doing consistently well in the hands of Shauna and I think it will continue to do so. We have Stephen Razor here with another top 16 with this Protect Yannick, Shalai, and Halar list. As I mentioned, I was very, very in favor of their list when I saw it the first time they made the top 16 with it. I liked how it basically was this sort of creature mid-range variant of the archetype with the ability to protect one's permanence and protect their combo pieces. And here we have, once again, another one ring deck. I love that this is a deck that is brazen enough to be a collector oof deck and play the one ring. I I think that really is indicative of how strong this card is. I think this is a multi-format or all-star. I don't think it's nearly as problematic as it is uh, in other formats, but I, I did go on record the other day and making it uh, known that it's akin to something like a Ristic Study. I think it is just a card draw staple of the format. And I'm not saying it's as good as something like a Ristic Study because that card's kind of busted. But as far as card draw and especially card draw and colors that don't traditionally have access to it, the one ring provides a lot. Yeah, but a lot of the strategy is trying to get access to your one card combos being Heliod, Sun Crown, and the Red Terror. Combo off with your commander, go infinite, do infinite damage that way, or you know, are able to do the Dockside and Meal combos. Once again, Meal actually having that secondary text, which is almost never relevant in CDH, but uh, being able to put a counter on Dockside when you have infinite mana is actually enough to kill your opponents with a meal. So, three separate combos there, very easy to assemble. I mean, this is like a Naya Heliod, plus you get all of these protection pieces. You get Skrell, you get Giver of Runes, you get Mother of Runes, Bo Benevolent Bodyguard, uh, Sylvan Safekeeper, just so many different ways to protect your combo, like Vexing Shusher and Boromir and like all of these different ways. So definitely a deck meant to go for a very clean combo, kind of make up for the fact that Naya doesn't have a lot of card advantage in the command zone and be able to out-tempo your opponents. We have Kraken Kitten by Sam Sapper. This is a Thrasios Tevesh list. This list is a Displacer Kitten, Holebreaker Horror, Seedborn Muse, kind of basically a, a Thrasios heavy list, it feels like, that also has the synergy of being able to just start doing crazy stuff with Displacer Kitten and Holebreaker Horror with your commanders. Definitely, definitely rocking that sort of Thrasios mid rage vibe, but uh, clearly making certain, you know, uh, effects to have the Thrasios and Tevesh in the command zone. Definitely using Tevesh as uh, a little bit stronger of a late game engine with something, especially obviously with Kitten, but uh, definitely the, the main difference here feels like, okay, if you don't want white for your Grand Abolishers and your Ranger Captain of Eoses, and you want to take advantage of a little bit more explosivity that you can get with Tevesh, that's what this archetype feels like to me. And also, you sort of get to play this little mini game with Tevesh, especially when you're like doing a Thrasios creature heavy thing, where you can just start ticking Tevesh up 
up and like gaining a bunch of value with it and eventually you get to the point where you play the mini game of like hey i'm gonna steal everybody's commanders and sometimes that's enough to really turn the tide of the game in your favor so tevesh really presents a clock in that sense as well but yeah apart from that it's just a, a very much heavily a traditional thrasios mid-range decks but definitely a little bit of a little bit of spice in there with tevesh in the command zone and once again that one ring i think i'm gonna keep seeing it tivit time by temujin temujin actually played in the last round of swiss they were on this tivit list which is uh, relatively consistent with a lot of the tivit lists that are out there in the format right now uh, like the inclusion of languish i know recently uh cal and i were talking on the mind sculptors about how languish is a really really solid board wipe in tivit specifically and i was talking about how the fact that uh you know tivit gets to take advantage of the fact that it is a large creature and yeah there are definitely bears in this deck that will die to something like a languish right but because of deluge and languish have that level of flexibility they really allow your deck to get around your other decks and your opponent's lists and uh, be able to sort of create an asymmetrical thing where you're wiping their boards and leaving yours alone because of how big Tivit is. Apart from that though, it is a relatively standard Tivit list. Once again, seeing this one ring, seeing a lot more of it. Uh, Imposter mech, you know, I've been talking about how clones are broken and uh, seeing more clones in the format, I think is gonna definitely pay off in the long run. But yeah, this is a pretty solid list and uh, congrats to Timutri for the top 16. Rockside by Corey Milhouse. This is the Rockside player who dunked on us in the Swiss of this tournament. They uh, they got a crazy start against us, flipping from uh, just like a, a turn one Remora without committing to the board, which like lessened my Dockside, and then uh, they like J-willed right into an Adnaz with perfect mana, and we we're like, okay, yeah, then the Rogside things. Interesting to see Fairy Mastermind in here. That is not traditionally a Rogside card I associate, especially because I find that the card is so inconsistent about when it triggers, and I don't find it triggering a lot in games that are so quick and explosive, so I'm interested to see it in a deck like Rogside, which is obviously trying to mitigate how long the game goes in general. Apart from that, it's a pretty traditional Rogsai list. We are at 24 lands, the, the old classic at this point, and just trying to win with Underworld Breach or Ad Nauseam or Thassa's Oracle and all the standard classic ways. This is just another Blue Farm deck in a world of too many Blue Farm decks by Brian Barton. Uh, this is a Blue Farm deck. And uh, fun fact, it's a Blue Farm deck in a world of a bunch of other Blue Farm decks. Uh, I actually had a coaching session with Brian uh, going over this list after they top 16 with it. We went over some cards that they switched out. So for example, I know for a fact that Avon Mind Sensor is uh, normally an opposition agent for paper tournaments, but uh, they didn't like the way the spell resolved over webcam. So that's why they use Avon Mind Sensor for this. And uh, a couple couple little niche things like that. Uh, I know you know some pieces like Unearth and Reanimate are a little non-traditional list. We had a whole conversation about how Unearth actually gives a lot of the value for, because specifically every single creature in this list can be hit for that. And then worst case scenario, you can cycle it away and also playing some of the the heavier cmc counter spells in this deck sort of just demonstrating that like blue farm has the flexibility to go a little bit slower which is what i would argue this blue farm variant is but at the same time still blue farm still very explosive still two extremely impressive commanders in the command zone able to put up a lot of pressure on your opponents and be able to perform really really well so congrats atraxa the last blink bender <laughs> this is so good i did not see the name of this deck until right now this is ritzy j's atraxa list you know, Atrax has been here. It's been showing up. It's been putting up results over and over again, right? It's a it's a deck that people are going to keep playing. I think it went through a phase where a lot of people were trying to play Atraxa, and then a lot of those people realized the Atraxa play patterns are difficult and a lot more difficult than they might originally seem. Brazen playing an Alchemist Refuge. I mean, the card's super strong, but in a four-color mana base where you're playing like Gaia's Cradle and Besaju and a basic forest and Urza Saga, like, oh my god. That's a lot of monocolored or colorless lands for a deck with a four color commander. That's crazy to me. But honestly, if you can make it work, it's obviously good enough to make the top 16, right? But yeah, uh, Atraxa definitely just, you know, doing the four color mid range thing as we've talked about on the channel here several times it's not the first attracts that's the problem it's the second one and every time that second attracts comes down you know you are as good as dead esper pirate farm by t dynamite t this is some pretty classic timna malcolm stuff we have you know your classic doomsday piles in here You're trying to crack those piles with your timna you have two of the most efficient value engine commanders in the command zone and very synergistic with one another in the fact that malcolm is an evasive flyer that creates mana 
Timna and Timna triggers off multiple attackers, and the fact that the two of them work together and are also an Esper, which is a super solid color combination, leads to a lot of Ws with this combo. Uh, Lotho showing up here, providing a lot of value here. Mastermind, sort of same thing. Pretty surprised to see Shredder. I know a lot of people are really high on Shredder, a lot of people are really low on Shredder. I tend to like it in Breach decks and Reanimator decks only, but for, for me, I would love to see more like a Mercurial Spell Dancer in this slot, but this feels like a, a sort of a pedantic <laughs> correction. The, apart from that, like this is really just trying to do this like mid-range plan that pivots into an Ad Nauseam plan, but uh, also here's another one ring deck. You can have Timna in the command zone and still feel pretty good about casting the one ring. So this card really just saying, I am here to stay in the format. James's Gitrog by James Singular. This is the first top 16 I've seen from Gitrog in a really long time. Yeah, I mean, just I feel like Gitrog like never makes these top tables and I'm noticing some pretty spicy stuff in this Gitrog list, which is awesome because I literally was just having a conversation with someone the other day about how I feel like a lot of Gitrog lists because there are so many people working on the universal list. Uh, a lot of them tend to look very similar and I like how this one does not. <laughs> this is a really cool Gitrog list. I like the fact that they're on Hermit Druid stuff and uh, I mean that one is the first thing that spoke to me just because I'm a big old sucker for Hermit Druid. Uh, they're on Braids of Risen Nightmare as well which is definitely a control piece that I feel like Gitrog's not used to and kind of a nice piece to pull this middle ground because a lot of the time Gitrog is so commander reliant that if you can just disrupt Gitrog once the game's not looking good for the Gitrog players. So very interesting to see some other pieces here that are looking to work Work around Gitrog's traditional play patterns. Um, checking the sources, there's no dread return, so very interested to see this Hermit Druid here. Although I guess the idea is that you just is the idea that you activate Hermit Druid when you have Gitrog on the battlefield, but then like how do you are there basics in this deck? Yeah, there are basics. Okay, so this is like a value Hermit Druid. Okay, yeah, okay. Value Hermit Druid I have not seen in a very long time, but I kind of like it if you have Gitrog on the battlefield then you play your uh and then you activate your hermit druid like you can mill up to like 30 40 50 cards and you can probably assume that a salvage is going to be in that pile so not traditional tech i've seen from gitrog but very interesting stuff I, th I think that's a it's a pretty cool innovation that i've never seen before in this archetype and i know there's going to be a bunch of gitrog players who's like actually in 2017 we tested this strategy vehemently and i'm, I'm sorry i wasn't there i'm sorry all right we have cat food by nato another attraction list here in our top 16 Grand Arbiter Augustine the Fourth, an interesting inclusion here. I'm a big old sucker for Grand Arbiter, so of course my brain is instinctively like, yes, brilliant addition. It's perfect, and I have no complaints. But I, I can, I like the synergy here. Like, I like the idea of just, you know, hey, uh, on four, I'm gonna play my Grand Arbiter, and then next turn, I'm gonna untap and uh, cast my Atraxa for five. It's pretty solid. So uh, yeah, definitely, definitely into that innovation with this archetype. It's also, once again, card I'm a sucker for. So try not to geek out too hard about that. But apart from that, this is a relatively standard attracts a list. A little bit higher in the artifact count than the one we saw earlier. This one's up to 14 artifacts, where the one we saw earlier in this episode was only on 11. But apart from that, nothing too crazy. A pretty normal attracts a list trying to resolve that big old seven mana impactful commander. I mean, I was literally talking to someone the other day on a Discord call, and they were like, yeah, it's, it's basically Grizzlebrand, or it's akin to it in some formats, which is like, that's a very... Uh, crazy power level to be compared to and that should be pretty indicative of how strong attract is before we go any further i'd like to remind you that here on community mtg we are ambassadors for monarch media and coming up october 7th through 8th we have lotus con in belleville illinois i've had people ask me if i'm going to this i've been promoting for months of course i'm going to be there it's going to be awesome it's going to be a great experience lotus con is going to be not only i mean this is it's a start there's a giant cedh tournament with a time twister thousands of dollars and prizing out to the top 32 but this is also an entire con right like there's there's amazing things there once again there, there are literally magic tattoo artists who are going to be at this con uh it's gonna be a great time there's gonna be a lot of creators that you know and love there myself included so you should definitely come check out lotus con and uh find out more from there moving in to our top four we have winning is for losers by pixel clerk 
Now, before I break down this list any further, it is worth noting that Chaos157, 2023, very creative name, by Tuka, who Pixel was the lovely person who jumped onto our channel to break down their tie-in list that they work on with their brother Tuka. And both of them made the top four of this tournament. Now, Pixel DM me and said, hey, do you mind just comparing our lists so you can see the main differences between the two? So we'll take a look through Pixel's list here, kind of go over some new pieces, and then we'll give it a little comparison to look at these two top four tie-in performances by the tie-in brothers. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, we have our classic tie-in stuff here. We have a lot of our, you know, the ways, it's not worth explaining in this video because we have an entire deck tech about a lot of the innovations of tie-in and a lot of the combo lines you can go through and stuff like that. Definitely some new pieces I'm seeing here like Luminous Broodmoth. Definitely a quick way to accrue a lot of counters on your creatures. Birthing Pot I also feel like was not in the last iteration of this deck that we had talked about and broke down here on this channel. Definitely some cool stuff, but for those who don't know, the idea is to end up in a scenario where you can activate Tyam an infinite amount of times, mill your entire deck, and then put a bunch of permanents on the battlefield, and then end up in scenarios where you can loop things like, for example, Moonglove Extract comes back in, shoots your opponent, and then you can loop that infinitely, therefore murdering your opponents. Let's compare that to Tuka's list here. So there's actually a pretty solid amount of differences here from the tie-in brothers. We have winning is losers by pixel being on hex drinker, which we talked about is just a great way to manually pump counters. Uh, Manglehorn, which I feel like is a super necessary inclusion in this format. We have Skyclave Apparition, which is, I'm definitely also surprised to see cut. And then Moonglove Extract, the main win condition that we talked about in Pixel's deck, uh, kind of removed. And Abzan Ascendancy, which was kind of an innovation that happened between the time where we recorded the deck tech and then like the next tournament that happened with Abzan Ascendancy. Uh, showing up in like no decks and then a bunch of decks and now sort of split between the two of these decks here. Uh, but yeah, there's a couple different interesting pieces here. Turn the Earth is definitely not one that I traditionally associate with the deck, but it's very interesting the idea to be able to save a bunch of your pieces that have been milled over and it's nice to uh, have that uh, be able to be something that's milled by Tyam's ability naturally and you have access to it right away. Here in Tuka's list, we see Seal Primordium, a way to repeatedly loop a bunch of different artifact and enchantment removal. Collector oof, hence the difference between Moon Glove Extract and not. This list playing oof to be able to handle that. Uh, necrotic Sliver, which is, wow, this one takes me back to when I was starting Commander playing Slivers uh, as a typo deck back then. Crazy to see that as a uh, loopable piece here. You know, six mana, basically remove any permanent is a very interesting thing that I did not expect to see in this Tyam deck. And this one's also on Null Rod. So this is a uh, much more of an anti artifact list but so uh, it's very interesting to see that Tuka's list despite being on no rod and oof is still on lion's eye diamond I think that's a very interesting choice there and uh, they're also you know they definitely share these fast mana pieces that uh, you know it's hard to cut from a lot of the lists in the format especially when you're trying to out tempo your opponents with a deck like time that definitely takes a bit of board state to build up interested to hear about the inclusion of Lester Mastacor. I'm wondering if it has something to do with the persist counters and looping it infinitely Secure drive scout not a card traditionally found in a lot of these lists very interesting to see i wonder if tie-in players are flooding out a little too much very crazy to see two tie-in players once again the tie-in brothers you know making a top four in this tournament. We have My Blue Farm by Ganesh. We have Timnacrom here. Pretty classic Blue Farm list. Uh, running Lavinia, which I know is sort of an in and out piece in a lot of Blue Farm decks. Professional Facebreaker, a piece that I really enjoy in Blue Farm, but uh, is not always played. Definitely much more of a mid-range piece for this list. But apart from that, it's a pretty standard Blue Farm list. Down to 27 lands, which I know a lot of Blue Farm players debate how many lands you actually want to be running. This one is on Fire Covenant and Toxic Deluge as well definitely a little bit heavier on the board wipes definitely able to answer certain decks like Tyam a little bit better and uh interested to see bowmasters here a lot of the uh, blue farm lists i know are really switching over to this card not all of them but definitely a, a significant amount of them for sure and uh yeah apart from that like not super crazy just pretty traditional blue farm list uh, not surprised to see one in the top four here and uh, nice job <laughs> we have jeeler by just ice uh another one of our coaching patrons here on the channel very cool to see just ice playing this list and uh unless i'm mistaken they have not been playing this list for very long one of the most interesting innovations in this deck is the fact that they are not on ad nauseum but they are on the 
one ring. This is like very, very similar to the classic memo speed needs no translation list, but like with that really interesting choice of being on the one ring and no adnaws in this archetype, definitely in a sense slanting more towards the mid range, but not going so much so that it's an extreme. Also flowering of the white tree, not a piece I'm traditionally aware of in Najila, but I really like it for putting on a lot of pressure into your opponent's life totals. The fact that all your warriors become two twos and Najila becomes a five one with war or sorry a five three with ward one. Very, very powerful in that circumstance. So uh congrats to Just Dice for once again I'm pretty sure picking up a deck that they are not known for playing and I don't think they had a lot of experience playing and then just taking down an entire tournament with it. That's a pretty impressive feat. So uh feeling pretty crazy about that. Ooh, also Spell Sky, definitely worth noting. I adore this card and I've actually been, I remember talking with Callahan of the Mind Sculptors, uh, talking about how Spell Sky is definitely underplayed in Najila specifically. So I'm really, really happy to actually see it, see play in this tournament winning deck list. Congrats uh, Just Ice on this list. Uh, Najila is obviously extremely strong. I like a lot of the, the subtle choices for this list that really were clearly able to take it over the top. And I'm definitely interested to hear how the flowering of the white tree was in this deck pretty cool card and that's our breakdown for chaos 5 remember if you like videos like this make sure to hit like and subscribe what do you guys think of this top 16 the top four it was a really interesting breakdown in my opinion and once again the fact that the tie am twins ended up in the top four together playing tie am and the fact that there's you know a lot of the one ring going around what do y'all think about that card do you think it is one of these cards that is going to just be a draw staple in the format do you think it is as i said comparable to ristic study or mr Grimora? do you think it's just maybe that's even like a crazy hyperbole definitely curious to hear about that stuff in the comments down below remember if you like videos like this hit like hit subscribe and if you want to support us check out patreon.com slash comedian mtg where you help to keep the lights on as i said moving towards cedh and the channel and coaching to be the full-time career so any little help is super appreciated our once again our patron tiers are sold out over at patreon for coaching but you can always ask me about one-on-one -on -one coaching you can hit me up on discord you can hit me up on twitter Twitter, or you can once again go to comedianmtg at gmail.com little email popping up right here for that and uh, check out the coaching availability I'm always open for it and uh, it's something I love to do so without any further ado thank you everybody for watching this video it's greatly appreciated and I'll uh, catch you on the next one peace I, I, I can feel the blood creeping up from the heathens got will got fight got pride got reason if they want to go eat then you know i'm gonna feed them if you're coming for me hope you're ready for a demon i got eyes in the back of my head i'm seeing take me for granted and you know i'm leaving i'ma take what's mine with the webs i'm weaving i could take this crap from seeing to believing got a taste for blood in my